as you choose his process, he can do a great work in your life. You know, in Romans 12, starting at verse 1, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what's God's, what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We've heard that verse a lot. You know, we use that a lot here in the Bible because that is the core of a lot of what we do. It's a process of transforming yourself. It never ends because you're constantly sometimes reverting back in certain areas of your life. There are certain parts of your life that just wants to do certain things that you just are in battle against. And so you have to consistently work on transforming, getting better, getting better. And we all know what a process is, right? A process, a lot of steps to get to an end goal, right? You start here with very little. Next thing you know, you end with a complete product or project, right? So I want you to think about it this way. Whenever you look at somebody, and you may not like what you see, you may not even like being around them, you never know where they are in their process. God may be doing a work in their life that they have to go through. All of us have a lot that goes into what makes us us. There's a lot of inputs where you grew up, who raised you, your neighborhood, your street, what went on in your house. Because you can have two people in the same neighborhood live right across the street from each other, grow up totally different, right? So what goes on in the, in them behind them closed doors makes a big difference, right? Then what school did you go to? Where did you go to college? Did you go to college? Where did you work? Did you work? Did you go to the services? All these types of things mold who you are, how you think, how you operate, and they have a lifelong impact on you. So what am I telling you? When you get into God's process, there's just as much unlearning as much as learning. When I really got to where I wanted to truly understand God, I had to realize there was a lot that was given to me, God-related, that was not as accurate as I thought it was because it didn't come from the right source. It might have come from a source that had good intentions, that really was focused on thinking that they were doing the best that they were doing. So no fault to them because they're giving me what they learned. But then over time, as you start to uncover and uncover and uncover, where is it? Why have I been living this way for all these years because that's what I was fed from a place that I respected so much. But it may not be accurate. Because a lot of times we try to live our life to perfection. We try to live our life based upon what we've been told and what we've been taught. I read an article just yesterday, and it was a great article. What it takes to be a good mother. The lady who wrote the article was preparing to adopt a child. And she was going through the adoption process. And now she was at the part to where she was going to be interviewed. They had to interview her and interview her and interview her because, you know, they got to do more than one just in case they uncover just a little thread of inaccuracy. Then they got to come to the house. They got to look across the whole house, look for anything suspicious, look for anything out of place, look for anything that gives them an indication that this new child would not be safe, nurtured, or guided in the right way. That's a big load for these people who coming in. But it's a big load for her. And how she explained it was very beautiful because she said this is harder than what it takes to, to have a baby. Because to have a baby, you are going to have a baby. If you are pregnant, you're going to have a baby. That baby's going to come. But for somebody to interview you to determine if you deserve a baby is a little bit different. And I said, you know, I never thought about it that way. That's very interesting. But she went in her mind and said, what does it take to be a good mother? So she started preparing her house. And the one thing she did, she said, what does a good mother smell like? She went to that degree. And I said, well, I really don't know the answer to that. So she started baking apples and putting a lot of cinnamon in the house. She said, well, apple pie, that's a good mother. And I said, yeah, I, I, I agree, you know. Apple pie, you, you, you baking apple pie, you must be all right. So she had the apple pie, 
She said, well, I got to make sure that I have all the clothes folded. I got to make sure I have the house clean. I got to make sure every pillow is in the right place. I got to make sure when they walk in the kitchen, they can tell that I can make a good lunch. I got to tell that a good mother doesn't give her kids chicken nuggets, so I can't have these in the fridge. I need to have organic things in the house. I need to make sure that they know with these apples that I can make a homemade applesauce for the baby. So when they want applesauce, I don't go to the store with all those preservatives. I make my own applesauce. And as I'm reading this, I'm like, that sounds like a really good mother if you're doing all that. But I don't know anybody that does it. So that must mean I don't know any good mothers because I don't know nobody that do this stuff. I don't. I can't tell you the last time I walked in somebody's house and said, what, apple pie? I, I don't, <laughs> never seen it, right? So when you think about it, that sounds like a good mother to y'all as well, right? But how far are you away from making your own applesauce? I can't tell you how many times kids said they hungry and I went to the freezer and dumped a bunch of stuff on the tray and shoved it in the oven and put it at 350. Eat, right? And they like it. Couldn't even make a peanut butter jelly sandwich. Just take this out the freezer and let it defrost. Crustable. What is it? Uncrustable. Whatever it is. <laughs> so when you think about it, that's what we do to us. We think about what a good mother is. And then you spend a lot of times in your life thinking how far away you are from doing some of that. And then the guilt can set in. I should do better on clothes. I should do better on cleanliness. I should do better on cooking. I should do better on filling whatever blank you want to fill in. But you don't give yourself a lot of credit. You just look at what they portray on TV and then how you are. Y'all know this. Uh, I think Publix do the best tearjerker commercials. I make fun of all of them. But, <laughs> but when you think about it, every time you look at those commercials, no matter how sad or how happy it is, the house is never dirty. It's always immaculate. Even when the daughter just happened to stop by, Mom, I wanted to surprise you. The house pillows all nice. Oh, welcome in. I'm, I'm looking in the background like, who live like that? She wouldn't read no newspaper, nothing. She just walk around cleaning all day long. But because that's what they portray. So the picture of a good mother that we have is not necessarily a good mother. It's a good, marketable, universal, marketable portrayal of a good mother. And that's what we want to live up to. I want that moment. I want this. You know, back in the day, it was uh, the Huxtables, right? The Cosby Show. Everybody, oh, I want to be like the Huxtables. Perfect. They have fun. They teach the kids. They transform their house in the blink of an eye. That's the teacher lesson. They sing. They dance. They put on the show. I don't even know how they did that, but I want that. That's a good portrayal, but it's not accurate, and it's not real. Now, why am I telling you this? Because a lot of us do the same thing with our Christian walk. We look at what's marketable. We look at what's portrayed. We look at what they think it's supposed to look like. Oh, I have to live like this. I got to talk like this. I got to dress like this. I got to act like this. Why? Because that's what they tell me. Who are they? The collective good Christian group, I guess, who tells me how I need to be. And what do we do? We spend our life trying to be that way. But then when it comes to win others, a lot of times you see their hangups are not with God. People who you try to teach to who grew up in the church, who know a little something about God, their hangup is not God. It's people. It's I can't live like that. That's not the life that I see for myself. I got to work on me first. And a lot of times they're not working on themselves for God. They're working on themselves enough to be accepted enough to walk through those doors to where they don't have judgment all over them. I talk like this. I do like this. I tell y'all one of the things that, that was crushing to me, the closer I got to understanding who God was, was I looked at my family, my cousins, my uncles, my friends of the family, because we got family, you got extended family who like family, right? Everybody I could think of grew up close to the church or in the church. And everybody I can think of is at their core, because I know them very well, very, very, very good people. 
But then a lot of people don't like coming to church. And I kept wondering why. So I asked a few, why? I don't live like that. I don't live like your daddy. And I'm like, me neither. <laughs> it's not a lot of people I know who do, right? But that's the thing. They measure up to, I can't be him. And it takes a lot of unlearning to realize you don't have to be. You can be you, but you have to go through his process for you. And that is so difficult to understand. That's hard to get a grip. Why is it so hard? Because you spent 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years being taught the other way. Since you went to Sunday school, you need to remember at least four scriptures. You don't know no scripture, shame on you. You need to at least know Psalms 23. Do you know the Lord's Prayer? I never heard what's What your mama been teaching you? Everything is judgment, judgment, judgment. Think about when you go to church. You never got popped more than when you was in church. Stay out of my purse. Sit still. Don't move. Pay attention. Like, what other spot in your life did you have to sit there as a five or six-year-old and go through singing, offering, pay attention to a man? You have no idea what he's talking about. Everything around you is forward, and you just got to sit here. And here, we start service at 1030. We get out around noonish. When I went to church, we started service Woo, right? And then you come out, the sun is bright, everything is changed, you hungry. You know, you ate breakfast, but you hungry again. Then you walk out, you go get something to eat. You think you're going to go home chain clothes. No, we got to go back, go back to hear the same man talk again. He didn't want to let us go the first time. We had to listen to how much money they got in the offering, the building fund, the update. We had a meeting, a service, singing, all this. And we got to go back. And I got to sit still again. Sundays were horrible. And constantly pinch, popped it. Or somebody bumped it. Right? You looking for some entertainment. Ooh, a little candy on the floor. Let me just bump it around with my feet, right? And it's hard not to go through your mama purse. Don't do that, but you, you, got, you got nothing else to do. I'm going to sit here and pretend like I'm reading the Bible. That don't work. Pay attention. No. It's hard. But you think about how we were taught and how we were raised since then. And if that's your only memory of church, you don't want to go back, right? So you got some unlearning to do. So, I got a little static. Y'all hear that? Is it the mic, do I need to change the microphone? Okay. I'll change it when y'all want me to. I'm going to keep going. So, here's a, a guy by the name of Jerry Bridges in this book called Transforming Grace. Beautiful quote. He says, The realization that my daily relationship with God is based on the infinite merit of Christ, not of yourself, but of Christ, instead of my own performance, is a very freeing and joyous experience. But it is not meant to be a one-time experience. The truth needs to be reaffirmed daily. So, what is he saying? He's saying that it's not about how hard I work. It's not anything that I gain. It's just about him. It's about having a relationship with him. That's all that I need. God loves us. In Romans 5 and 8, y'all know this. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, he died for us. That's a lot of love. Go to Ephesians 2, 4 through 9. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
Listen, not by work so no one can boast. There is nothing you can do to get closer to God. You are as close as you're going to get. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. You're not going to get any closer because he's not going to love you anymore. He loving you. As soon as you, you notice him, he's, that he's been loving you, is that love. So what does it mean to get closer to God? Really what you're doing is you're not getting closer to him. You're just understanding more about him. You're involved more with him, right? So when you think about a married couple, once they get married and they love each other, it's not about getting closer. It's just about learning more about your habits so that we can cohabitate a little easier, so that we can know what's your yin to my yang type of thing. You know what I mean? How we going to operate in this thing smoothly. It's not about loving you more. I love you. Or else I wouldn't bring you in my house. You wouldn't bring me in yours, right? So we love each other. That love, what we call what love grows, is really just more of an understanding. And I have the desire. I love you so much that I have the desire to want to learn more about you, to sit here and study you, to be involved with you enough that I care, because I love you as much as I do, that I care to change myself in order that you can be happy. So it's not about loving you more, it's about understanding you more. That's our relationship with God. And we'll say the, the process of learning and understanding God is hard. It's hard, it's hard to be a Christian. Go back to what we just talked about. It's not hard to be a Christian, it's hard to live up to other people's standards of what it takes to be a Christian. But once we bring that down, we realize that like it says in John 14 and 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. So what is this saying? He loves us so much that he's saying, I'm not going to even make it hard for you. You don't even have to figure it out for yourself. I'm going to give you somebody who's going to work with you on a daily basis to make this as easy as it possibly can be. Well, what's his job? Well, in 1426, he says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. I always thought that the Holy Spirit was just going to remind me of Scripture. Right? That makes sense. Because he said, remind you of everything that I said to you. So I said, as I read the Bible, then he's going to remind me of verses that I might have missed. Then I had to think. I said, well, when Jesus said this, he didn't hold up no Bible. Because there was no Bible to hold up. He said, I'm going to remind you of everything that I said. So what does that mean? Well, let's look at it. John 16 and 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only of what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So it said he's going to remind you of everything, right? And then he says he will guide you into all the what? Truth. And who is Jesus? I am the way, the truth, and life. So he's going to guide you more to get that closeness and understanding and remind you of who Jesus is, of what he says he is, of what he represents in your life. Y'all understand that? I know you do. He says in 14 and 17 in John, the spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. One more. I know it's a lot of scripture, but it's, it's good. It can teach itself. You don't even need me. John 15, 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Why am I spending so much time on this? When you think about the spirit of truth, that's what you need in your life. A lot of what we hear about what it takes to be so good and so close to God is not coming from the spirit of truth. It's coming from the spirit of good intentions. It's coming from the spirit of what I know. It's coming from the spirit of what I was taught. And that's okay in certain realms. It helps get us there. It helps us understand a little bit more because it's coming from a good place. It may be what they were taught. We get it. But you have to link up to the spirit of truth. And what is the spirit of truth? It is the bedrock that we build our lives on. It is the understanding that we are free from judgment, that we are free from guilt, that we are free from all the misunderstanding, the despair, all the hurt that comes with life. The spirit of truth says you are free from that. 
And until we realize that we are free from that and we are not under the bondage of what this world wants us to be, we're going to live in chains. Because you're always going to be looking at what other people expect you to be. Because all you have to do to get people's judgment is have a baby. Young mothers, have a baby. You bring a baby out. It's going to be somebody that's going to say something about how you are treating that baby. Bring them out under six weeks without something over their head. And watch the looks that you get at Crow. Walk around with a little bitty baby and watch people look at you. Oh, no, and watch some sweet old lady talk to the baby, but they really talking to you. Your mama brought you out without a jacket on. What is she doing? Talking to the baby, talking to you. Why she got you on this? You ain't got no little gloves on your hands. You going to scratch your face. They know you scratch your face when you lit. nobody clipped your nails off. They talking to you. All you doing is standing there. This your baby. She don't even know you. Judgment. Right? And how you feel? You're like, I'm just trying to figure this out. Like they didn't make no mistakes when they had a baby. But it's on you now. Same thing with Christianity. Why you dress like that? Why you talk like that? I thought you were a Christian. I thought you were this. I thought you were that. All these things. But when was the last time when you see a baby, that baby not in danger? Now, the baby in danger, speak up. Say something. But it's just something you disagree with. Hey, you be all right. But that's how we do every time we see something that we don't like, we feel we need to say something. And then in the Christian faith, the only difference is everybody is speaking for God. God don't want you to do this. You going to go to hell. Wow. Really? Really? So now you're sending me to hell. But then the same verse, when you say, no, nah, I don't really care. I want to do what I want to do. Well, I ain't got no hell or heaven to send you to. Do what you want to do. That's some rough stuff, ain't it? Don't that sound like a parent? Well, just do what you want to do. See how you turn out. I had an uncle just like you. Oh. Judgmental. But that's how we treat people. But we don't think about the power of our words. And how they burden and oppress people. And while God trying to love them, we steady pushing them, pushing them, pushing them. Because we don't like things about them. It's okay if you don't like it. They're not here for you. Don't talk to them. Don't be around them. That's okay. Let them get close to God. Let his process work, not yours. Because your process might have them further away from God than they need to be. But we need to go to the spirit of truth. It counts. So, let's wrap this up. God loves us so much. The hardest thing about it, though, the hard thing about this process is loneliness. We feel alone. Jesus came. He spent 33 years on this earth. He died on the cross for our sins. We know that's a gift. But then he left. So we look at the people in the Bible, and they had Jesus right there. They could hear him. They could see him. They could touch him. They could experience him in a different way. We have faith and belief that he once walked this earth and that he did all these things. And if you try to explain this situation to people who never heard any of this, it sounds very weird, right? Rightfully so. But we believe and we have faith. So in the end, we got to feel kind of alone because what we see is us doing all the work. We do all the praying, we go to church, we have all the hope, we have all the faith, we want things to change. But how do we know, know, know that God is actually doing anything? It's just our faith. But when you explain that to somebody, they're like, help me understand, that don't make sense. And when you think about it, sometimes we get in our own feelings and it doesn't make sense to us. And we start to distance ourselves from the work of God. And go into our own thing. Well, I ain't heard nothing. I'm just going gonna, gonna to do what I got to do. Wait on the Lord. I can't wait no longer. Gets frustrated, right? Because we know in the scripture, right? John 14, 1 through 4. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would not have told you. 
that I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. See, there is confusion about this because we do feel alone. But if we look at what Jesus is saying, Jesus really talked about the customs that were going on in his day. And what would happen, he, he really likened us to the bride and him to the husband, right? We saw that a lot. So if you look at this relationship and how it worked, when a husband, when he chose a bride, when the families chose a bride, the fathers of both individuals would meet, they would have a glass of wine, they would toast, and that would seal the engagement. Then the bridegroom, he would go, after they negotiate their price, he would go back to his father's place. He will tell the bride, I'm going to my father's house to prepare a room for you because right now there's nowhere for you to stay. And he will go to his father's house and he will build an adjacent room onto the house. Now, the secret to this is they would do this over and over again if they had many children to the point to where at the generation after generation, they would have what's called an insula, which is a place of, of cohabitation where they would all have meals together and all these different families would be. But only the father of the groom could tell you when the room was finished because it was his property and it had to match up to his standard. So only when he said it was okay could the groom go back to get the bride. Now, when the work was complete, he would go see the bride. But up until that point, it could be six months, could be nine months, could be long, depending on the resource, right? He, the, 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 well, the, the, the bride, would stay back, she was younger, and she would learn the customs of what it takes to be a wife. She would learn a lot of different things on what it would take for that particular husband because based upon the profession, based upon who they were, based upon their status in the community, there were certain things that she had to learn in order to be a proper bride, right? So she would spend time working on herself, working to make sure that she was perfected to be his bride. And then one day, the sound of the shofar, which was a ram's horn, would sound. And then later in that day, the bridegroom would come to pick up his bride. But waiting for him to come in were the maids of honor or the maids, right? And Jesus speaks on this too because usually it was around dusk that the groom would come. But he could come whenever he wanted. It was on him to when he would come. In Matthew 25, starting at verse 1, Jesus gives a parable. He says, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish one took their lamps but did not take any oil, right? The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time key part of this scripture and they all became drowsy and fell asleep all of them at midnight a cry rang out here's the bridegroom come out to meet him then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps the foolish ones said to the wise give us some of your oil our lamps have run out no they replied there may not be enough for both of us instead go to the people who sell the oil and get you some more but while they were on their way to buy more oil the bridegroom arrived and the virgins who were ready went in to the wedding banquet. The door was shut. The others came and asked to open the door, but he would not open the door. What is this telling us? Well, remember when we talked about those, the bridegroom coming, the maidens were there to greet the bridegroom, but he usually comes at dusk. So they know what time he's supposed to come, but this bridegroom came at midnight. They didn't have enough oil for that because he didn't come at the traditional time he came later so they weren't prepared so you get two sermons in one today because as the bride you see that you have to prepare yourself through the process and then jesus gives us another view of this as the bridesmaid you always have to be ready for whenever he comes because you need to know that i'm always ready but notice that everybody got distracted all 10 fell asleep but who is prepared and who is ready? The world is always going to distract you. The world is always going to pull you away. The world is always going to have something there to get your attention. But do you have enough oil in the tank to know 
that when you need to turn away, get back in line, fall straight? Or will you be so distracted and so not ready that you just follow what the world wants you to do? This world is full of distractions. That's what it wants you to do. So don't guilt yourself. Don't say that I'm not worthy. Don't say that you're not enough. God loves you just the way you are. But are you committed enough to him to make sure that you are always ready? So that when he comes, not when the rapture happens, not when the skies open, but when he comes for you. Because I don't know when he may come for you. I don't even know if he may come back. He might come back in our lifetime. He might not. But I do know one thing. We all will have our day. So when he comes for you, when he walks in your room, when he taps your shoulder and say, let's go, are you going to be ready? That I cannot answer. But he's given you enough. What we understand today is he's given you enough in his process that if we listen to him, if we focus on him, if we tune ourselves to him, if we commit ourselves to him, to know enough about him, to love him back, that that's all we need. That if we can show that we love him, not about what your mama did, not about what your daddy did. The last thing you want to be is, so, is there on somebody else's credit. You don't want to walk into a store and say, uh, my mama got good credit with you. Can I get this sofa? You can't be up there for your mama credit. It don't work that way. Can't nobody put Jesus' bill in their kid's name, right? You can't do that. You got to stand there on your own, too, based on what you have and what you know. And you can't go up there based on what other people have told you. You got to have a relationship for yourself. So, people, here's what I want you to know. No matter where you are in life, no matter how good you think you are, no matter how bad you think you are, no matter how much guilt you have in you right now, Jesus loves you just the same as he loved me, just the same as he loved him, just the same as he loved anybody else in here. You stop separating yourself from God just based on your past mistakes. Quit trying to fix yourself. We spend so much time trying to fix ourselves and still end up more broke. Just like the kid that break the lamp and then try to glue it back. Wish you would have just left it alone. It looked worse. Because we patchworking things that didn't even need to be patched up. He wants you to be broken. You say, what? Why does he want us to be broken? People, have you ever walked into a house that was messed up? that needed a serious remodeling job. Because me, you, me and him used to work together with my dad. We used to get fussed at together, right? I remember we used to walk in the buildings and you would see stuff that needed paint, needed new walls, doors been broken down. House looked horrible. And Pops would take the job. We gonna go in, we gonna fix it from top to bottom. The first day we get in there, we don't go in there with paint. We don't go in there with, with, with uh, uh, spackling and mud and sheetrock. We don't go in there with anything. You know what we go in there with? Sledgehammers. We go in there with sledgehammers. We go in there with stuff to break most stuff. And we rip stuff out. That was the best days because I could do that, right? Good at tearing stuff up. Ripping out cabinets. Ripping out old stuff. Killing bugs that's running out of stuff, right? Take all that stuff, dump it in the front yard. And the house looked worse than when we got there, because you done tow stuff up. But you got to rip all the stuff out before you bring the new stuff in. So sometimes when you're trying to fix people and glue them back together, God is telling you, I'm ripping stuff out. Leave them alone. I'm remodeling here. I know the yard looks bad, but I got a dump truck that's taking all that away. You trying to fix this and put it back in. I don't want that crap in here. I want it gone far away. Leave them alone and let me perfect them. Because here's the thing. We go through God's process for a reason. Because in the end, just like that remodeling job, in Philippians 1 and 6, he says, Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What does this mean? However long it takes. I will carry it on to completion. And if that takes me every day for the rest of your life to work on you, because it will, he's going to carry it out till you are fully who you need to be. So don't worry about how it looks today. It may look broken. It may look really bad. But that's okay. You are a remodeling job in progress. And you will be built up bigger 
and better than you ever had. Because when we got through with the job and the owner came back, they're like, this look like a different house. We done cleaned up. We done took all that stuff away. No more sledgehammers. No more bucket of paint. Next thing you know, new carpets coming in. You got a fresh smell. There's no mold. There's no old looking rotting wood. Everything look fresh and new. Looks like a brand new house. And guess what they call it? Move in ready. Just a few weeks ago, it was not move in ready. It looked horrible. That's how my dad did when I bought my first house. We walked in, I said, I do not want this house. This house looks bad. But he said, all you need is, he saw it differently. God sees you differently than the world. See, the world will look at you and they'll step back. They'll go, oh, ain't no saving them. Ain't no helping them. I told them about God. They didn't want no, no part of that. But God sees it and says, oh, I see all the potential. Look at what I could do with this individual. So what how you were raised? So what what you've done in your past? So what who people say that you are? So what? What your family even say. It does not matter. You are perfect in God's eyes because there is so much potential in you, regardless of your history. So let his process work. Trust the process. Amen. 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 We just thank God for you. Uh, that's one of my favorite series that we've done just for the simple fact that it I hope it reveals to you a lot of truth because so much of our life you know we hear so many things and so much of it you have to dig into and, and understand and see if it's true and especially in today's world right we live in a world where people say so much they say whatever they want to say and I guess it's true I guess it's not true it used to be a time when you you had facts behind stuff, you know? Now it's, it's opinions. We just have a lot of opinions that come out. And it's hard to say what's true and what's not true because we got so many different sources. You got Twitter or X or whatever it's called. You got all the other social media. And if you're on Facebook or Instagram or whatever you're on, you come across all these news articles that say this is happening, that's happening, and this happened, and only to find out later that it's not true, right? Politicians run on falsities that's not even fact check we just believe it and other people spew it out just the same so we live in that type of world today where it's hard to know what's true and what's not so you need this to ground you that no matter what the world may tell you about yourself right they can tell you whatever they want about what's going on in the world and you got to fact check that fact check that for yourself but when it comes to you you do have a source of truth one source of truth, and that's God. So when you pray to him, you ask him what you need to do. You ask him to reveal to you your truth so that you know where to go and help put the right people in your life to help guide you and inspire you to encourage you to go that way. Not just people who you think are the right ones, because you may be wrong, but he will put those people in your life to tell you the full and whole truth.